Hello, Ansible Automate's virtual attendees. My name is Jason Rittenauer. I'm a cloud domain architect here in the North American public sector team at Red Hat. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how we can secure secrets like passwords and other credentials, other sensitive information in Ansible workflows using both Ansible Vault. And since this presentation is called A Tale of Two Vaults, we're going to talk about how we can extend that further with a third party secrets manager, HashiCorp Vault. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into the slides and see how all this works. So the things we're going to talk about today are security and automation in general. Uh, we're going to go over some interesting data points here about security, cloud security at scale and how that relates to automated workflows. Then we're going to specifically dive into um, Ansible Vault, how it encrypts and can be used in, in part of an automated workflow. And then we're going to expand on that and go a little bit further with, uh, like I said, we're going to talk about HashiCorp Vault in particular. But a lot of the mentality here is going to apply to really any third-party secrets, uh, uh, secrets manager. Um, the specifics are going to vary as far as their capabilities and what they what they can do with like dynamic credentials and that kind of thing. But the, the thought process applies to all of them. Um, and, and you know you can kind of take away some of this and, and think about what you are using if you are using another uh, another security tool. So human beings are really bad at security in general. Um, this is something we've known for a while. Uh, you know, security is really it's a lot of it is is a behavioral based problem, right? You can have a very large key length. You can have um, the most advanced encryption in the world. But if you're writing your passwords down on a post-it note and sticking them under your keyboard or something like that, that completely de defeats the purpose. So what we generally find with security, in especially in, in any context, but in particular in automation, it's going to boil down to what what is the, the human behavior that is compromising security? Are we using weak passwords that, that are easily human readable and remembered? Or are we doing some sort of complex random string that... that you, can't, you don't really need to know because you're only using it in an automated workflow and once it's saved into to Ansible Vault or Tower, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, but you know, the, the data doesn't support that. What we see uh, from, from some of these various surveys and, and uh, analyst reports are that 80% of data breaches leverage compromised passwords. And 73% of the users we see we, we, that these surveys have talked to are using the same passwords for both personal uh, uh, logins as well as work accounts. You know, you try to try to um, you know tie it, use the same password over and over again, so you don't have to remember more than one. Uh, you know, this and this is where you know, like a password manager comes into play. If they can randomly generate passwords for you that you don't have to worry about, that makes it easier. Um, think about how many accounts you had back maybe ten or fifteen years ago. You might have like your your personal email or internet. Uh, service provider login, and then maybe you might have a bank password or something like that. But but since more and more things have been moving to um, an online presence, we see more and more that there are just so many different passwords we have to memorize. My my current password count and my password manager that I use just for personal stuff. This isn't even work, but just personal passwords. I've got around two hundred and fifty. Uh -huh. So that that's quite a few things, and obviously I could just use the same password over and over again for all of them, but if one of them gets compromised, then that gives you access to all of my stuff. Because that's the next data point here is a compromised service account can grant access to both vertically, meaning throughout the same system, and horizontally, meaning all across all the different systems in your environment. So this is where, you know, just, just basic passwords and credentials are the first part of the problem here, right? So automation is ultimately going to improve security in general. Um, feeding logs into one, the one centralized log aggregation system and parsing them with some sort of uh, analysis system looking for threats, that's, that's one thing that greatly improves security right there. So have some sort of uh, automated uh, response, being able to, to dynamically uh, do intrusion detection and then do uh, intrusion like a... a response to that threat, being able to, to automate uh, changes to your firewall in response to a detected issue, uh, things like that. 
<clears throat> we're starting to see more and more automated AI-driven incident response. And th these are the types of things that are ultimately going to make the cloud of the future more and more secure. And some of this is here today, some of it's in its infancy, but we do know this is going to greatly improve and automation is going to drive this as life goes on. Both, both things like Ansible, uh, things like Kubernetes operators, and other uh, third-party software is going to ultimately uh, just be more more intelligent and less less uh, need for human intervention to improve the security landscape. Now, just going back to, to basic, you know, Linux and Windows system administration and, and uh, network devices, some of the objections we hear when we talk to customers are, you know, everything we automate we need to be able to authenticate against. That means that we need some way of, of authorizing, I am this person, I say I am, and I have the ability to access these resources. So we still tend to treat automation, automated actions, as if it were an actual human being sitting behind a keyboard, performing these keystrokes, performing these mouse clicks. And that is a is a major drawback to how we are approaching automation because again we're going back to we need to make this easy for human beings to be able to do while also making it secure if we completely divorce ourselves from the idea of we need to make this human readable and human usable then that's going to also go a step for, uh, forward in increasing our security and making it uh, making it more secure by design because the third data point here is this model of the, this mode one way of doing things, of, of trying to make it easy for human beings to do and to replicate, doesn't map well to mode two operations, things that need to be done at so-called cloud scale of spinning up hundreds or thousands of virtual machines and containers and, and tying them all together and authenticating back against the database and things of that nature. So in order to make this more automatable, we need a way of handling our credentials. And the first thing we have here is Ansible Vault. Now this is the built-in method of encrypting passwords and other sensitive structured data. Um, Ansible Vault does use AES-256 symmetrical key encryption. So that's some of the most secure uh, encryption protocols there are today. Uh, I would not say at this point that AES-256 would still technically be considered un un uh, unbreakable. But it is. It would take a very long time to get through that key length with with modern uh, systems at your disposal. Now, vaulted information can be stored in source control, um, so that's another nice benefit to it. But then some people might look at that as a drawback of I don't want my vaulted information to be in the same source control. I've got my actual uh, automation, my playbooks, and, and things of that nature. But uh, and to, we can dive into that later as we start talking about the third-party secrets manager. <clears throat> Ansible also supports multiple vaults because, you know, you, you probably don't want to store everything in the same locker. Uh, you might have different uh, secrets that are should be accessible to certain parts of your organization and some secrets that are accessible to other parts. So because of that, Ansible does allow you to have multiple vaults so that you can kind of uh, put a firewall in between various sensitive bits of information that, and limit who can access it and what workflows they can use that information in. And finally, your passwords that decrypt the vault can be stored either locally or in a third-party secrets manager. So you can actually tie back into HashiCorp Vault or some other secrets manager that way. So here's the workflow of how you would uh, vault information in Ansible. You can see what I'm doing here in this screenshot. I am doing a creating a new file using the Ansible Vault command. Uh, this is going to create this uh, this hello AAV YAML file. It's going to ask me to create a password and confirm it in order to actually encrypt it. So it's going to do that. It will show me the uh, the it'll bring up the page to edit it after I've completed that command and put in my password. I put in my information here, my Hello Ansible automates virtual attendees, and then I save it. And then that brings me back to the command prompt. And you can see then if I cat that file, what I get back is a big blob of, of encrypted data. It tells me that it is an Ansible Vault uh, encrypted parameter. Um, it's, it is AES-256, but everything else is, is just a string of, of bits. And uh, you can see 
the way Ansible Vault works is it takes an unencrypted file, it applies a key to it to encrypt it, and then it, it takes that same key to unencrypt it. So you can get it back out, you can read it, you can uh, use that in automated workflows. So again, if you feed it structured data, you can have like your variables uh, programmed into it. You can have um, bits of other sensitive information that maybe isn't, a, isn't like a password, but something else you, that you don't want to be exposed to, uh, to the world and, uh, and out there accessible for everybody. So again, it is AES-256, um, and it, this can be used in a lot of different contexts. So you can see, um, to actually read that file, I can use the Ansible Vault command to then view it. And again, it'll ask me for my password, and I can uh, then uh, see the actual text in that file. Now, a couple other uh, important data points about Ansible Vault are you can rekey a file, so you can then, uh, you know, of course, have to, you have to enter the existing key, and then you can enter a new password to, uh, to re-encrypt to re it. Um, it's also important to point out that if you lose the, the, the password, if you forget it or whatever, there is no recovering that. Uh, once it's encrypted in Vault, if you don't enter the proper password to decrypt it, it's, it's lost and gone forever. So always make sure you, you make good note of the passwords you're, you're using to encrypt your, uh, your Ansible Vault uh, because once you lose it, it's gone for good. You can also use Vault in Ansible Tower and uh, AWX, the upstream version of Tower. <clears throat> Again, it supports multiple vaults. It allows you to enter your Vault password as a credential. You can then use that credential in your uh, job templates and uh, dynamically decrypt vaulted information using that password. And again, uh, Tower itself, everything you save as a variable there is once you enter it into, uh, into Tower and save it, it is not able to be retrieved uh, through standard means. Uh, it is possible to debug and expose some of that information as you, uh, when you're doing debugging. Uh, but but the, generally speaking, you can't go in and, and then view the, uh, the saved uh, password or, or any other sensitive information. It's, it's in there, and uh, it, you can, all you can do is overwrite it. You can't actually view it without, uh, without uh, backdoor access and, and debugging. So there are some limits of Ansible Vault. Uh, the first is it can only be used within the context of Ansible. So if you have other parts of your automated workflow that Ansible's not driving, which, yeah, that's crazy, you would, you would think you want Ansible doing everything, right? Uh, but we, we know that realistically there are some other parts, some other tools in your automation keychain that maybe Ansible was handing off to or picking up from. So if you have like Jenkins doing some stuff and you don't want Ansible to, to direct that, if you have... Um, a Kubernetes engine that's spinning up containers and maybe you don't want Ansible hand, uh, managing the secrets for that. Um, maybe you've got like HashiCorp Terraform spinning up your instances to begin with and Ansible doesn't, isn't going to be driving that. So having all that information in a vault makes that inaccessible to anything but Ansible. Now again, Ansible can drive all of those other parts of the automated workflow, but for some reason, maybe you don't want that. So that's going to mean that, that Ansible's ability to vault uh, information isn't going to help you in those other parts. It is only for storing information, not managing. What do I mean by that? Well, you enter information into Ansible Vault. Um, Ansible Vault doesn't have the ability to say, hey, this password that you gave me is 30 days old. We should go and reset it and put a new, newer uh, password in. Or, um, you know, this... SSH public key that you're using might have been compromised, you should rekey it. Things like that. Ansible is only taking information and storing it and applying it where you're telling it to. It's not actually managing password aging. It's not, it doesn't care about password complexity. It doesn't care about whether if your credentials for Amazon have been compromised. It's not doing any of that. So it's not an intelligent approach to automation or to security rather. And then there are concerns about cloud scale automation that Ansible Vault doesn't address. And we're going to get into those here as we um, talk through the rest of this presentation. But needless to say, when you're doing things at the scales at the factor of hundreds of servers, thousands of servers, 
reusing the same password across all of that fleet of servers doesn't make sense. And we're going to get into why as we go forward here. And to that end, here's a hypothetical scenario I want to talk through. So let's say you're creating a multi-tiered application in Amazon uh, using the Amazon EC AWS EC2 module. So the first thing you need are AWS access keys, which if you're using Ansible playbook on the command line, that might be under um, the AWS hidden folder uh, in the credentials file, or it could be an Ansible tower. You might have a set of AWS credentials staved in there, regardless of how you're doing it. In most cases, your credentials, your Amazon credentials are going to be something that you or another human being generated from Amazon's uh, either through their CLI or through their, uh, their web UI console and downloaded those credentials, saved them into a file statically. So human beings touched them and interacted with them. They saved them in a file. They saved them in tower. Regardless, they're out there and they're, they're there permanently, right? Or semi-permanently. So you create your database instances with, with those Amazon access keys, and then you go into uh, SSH into it using public key authentication, which is honestly one of the most secured ways to do SSH, but you SSH into those instances, you install Postgres and other, data, other necessary packages, you maybe you do a yum update, all well and good, right? That's, that's public key authentication, um, no problem. But again, they're saved on a system by, by human hands, um, if it's a shared system that you're doing, like a bastion that you're doing uh, automated workflows from, maybe you have them stored in your home directory, but anybody who has root can get access to them. Um, and quite frankly, let's be honest, how many of us are actually aging out our SSH keys? Uh, you know, they're, they are, if you have an appropriate key length, that's harder to compromise, harder to, to crack, but still uh, using the same SSH keys over and over for years on end, Eventually, it is possible, however unlikely, that somebody could crack them and use them. So, you know, that's something else to think about. How long do you want your SSH keys to exist and, and go without being aged out and, and replaced with a new, new string, new, new string of keys? And then fi the final step of this uh, automated process is going to be instantiating the Postgres database and adding users. Now, in this case, we are using a vaulted password to set the database password for our, our production uh, database here. So that all sounds well and good, right? We are, <clears throat> but we have used three different sets of credentials here. And again, they've all been created and touched by human hands and stored and saved. Um, they are readable by human beings. And a couple of the, the points here are you know, those Amazon credentials could be compromised. They could be used to, to spin up a bunch of instances and, and uh, mine Bitcoin. The, the SSH key could be used to SSH in and get unauthorized access to the servers. If, if it was on a shared server and somebody else had access to it, some bad actor. Um, and finally, if you're using the same password across all those database servers, well, the big problem here is if one of those guys gets compromised, one of them gets popped, and somebody manages to get that database password through like a SQL injection attack or something, guess what? They've got access to all of your database servers in theory. Um, again, that goes back to that horizontal and vertical access. If, if they get access to one part of the system, they could exploit an issue there, get access to the, the remainder system, they could get root theoretically, they could get access to your entire fleet of servers. So having that one weak point, that one commonly used password throughout all of your systems opens you up to, well, if they get access to one system, they could theoretically get access to everything then. So this is where the need for a more um, security focused tool set comes in. When you're doing things at this kind of scale, you need something that its only job is to worry about managing credential, credentials and other sensitive information. So, this brings about the need for another kind of vault. And again, we're going to focus on HashiCorp Vault. HashiCorp Vault is built as secrets as a service, meaning it exposes an API that does nothing but stores, secures, and dynamically generates uh, credential information and other sensitive uh, info. It can be used to dynamically generate credentials for Amazon, Azure, databases, and other uh, credential types 
And then the nice thing about this is you can set a time to live on them. So I could theoretically spin up an Amazon, a set of Amazon credentials to go create new machines in EC2. And then I could have that, that set of credentials expire after 15 minutes, 20 minutes, a half hour, whatever, however long it takes to execute your workflow. But the nice thing is once you're done with them, boom, they're gone. And it's still, it's still going to tie back. It's still going to be um, auditable. It's going to be logged, but you don't have to worry about somebody getting that same set of credentials then and, and reusing them to, to spin up their own instances somewhere else. Vault does have a, a break glass capability where you can say, hey, this vault got compromised. I need to revoke all of the effector credentials and start from scratch. That is doable. So you can basically halt access to everything while you sort out your, uh, your security breach. Ansible community plugins allow for several of the credential types that Vault can manage to be integrated into uh, Ansible workflows using native uh, using these plugins. And then for the credential types that aren't supported in these plugins, you can then call into um, uh, Vault's API using the URI and other modules uh, for things that aren't supported yet. And then the, the final thing here is it can be used outside of Ansible to secure other parts of your workflow. So again, this goes back to things like Jenkins. Um, it has native secrets for Kubernetes. So if you want, uh, if you want Kubernetes to spin up a bunch of pods and, and you don't want uh, Ansible to be aware of any of the secrets exchange there, you can have Vault uh, do all that kind of stuff. So let's go back and revisit our scenario we talked about earlier. So this time we're going to say that Ansible is going to retrieve its credentials to create the Amazon virtual machines from Vault, and we're going to set a time to live on those credentials for 30 minutes. And again, that can be adjusted to whatever fits your workflow, but the bottom line is once Ansible spins up its VMs, um, those credentials are going to go away. They're not going to be reused. Um, even if you do like full debug out output on Tower, it's still not going to show, it, even if it shows those credentials, it, they can't be reused again because we've done our, our automated workflow and we're done. And uh, we're going to retire those credentials from, uh, from HashiCorp Vault, either after a time we've set, or we could actually, again, go in and make an API call and say, I'm done with these credentials, delete them, disable them, whatever. Um, we're going to SSH into the instances using dynamic one-time passwords. It will be unique for each instance. So again, this goes, this is kind of like the next step beyond, uh, SSH public key authentication, the ability to, to do a one-time password, to get access, to do, uh, you know, elevate to um, sudo as we need to, su. But then again, once we log out of that system, once uh, Ansible logs out of the system after it's done its work, that password's no longer good. So again, full debug uh, log output, I could grab that password and try to use it again, but it's already been used once and tower is not going to let you uh, reuse that. And then finally, the ability to generate dynamic database passwords for each instance. So again, each instance is going to, each database instance will have its own unique password uh, for every system, for every database. And again, like that, that dynamic set of Amazon credentials, we can set them to expire after a certain amount of time, like 30 days, 60 days, what have you. And then we can have tower our, our um, excuse me, not tower, we can have the database um, actually can make a call back into Vault and say, hey, I see my uh, password's about to age out. Can you give me a new set of credentials, a new, new database password? And Vault will do that. Um, so again, we're taking a lot of the human legwork out of security. So we're, we're eliminating the, the basic human laziness, the, the, the desire to make things easy on human beings to do our automated workflows. We're taking all that out and we're trusting our third-party security tool that, that is built specifically to keep a cloud-scale uh, deployment secure, and we're letting it handle some of these more difficult, more strenuous tasks. So, to dial back, um, somebody grabs those EC2 keys in my, my HashiCorp workflow, well, doesn't matter, they're expired. Uh, I don't have to worry about manually rotating out SSH keys or updating my, my public key on a, on a server or anything like that. And again, one of my database servers gets hacked. I don't have to worry about that whole ver vertical or uh, horizontal scale. I could actually just take that one database server out of commission. Uh, you know, 
take it off the, the network and then go do my forensic forensic analysis and then just spin a new one up in its in its place and it will reach out to Vault and get a new database password. So that makes that kind of stuff a lot easier to deal with with automated threats. So with that, we're going to go do a demo. Uh, we're going to show you how you can do um, SSH one-time passwords in the context of Ansible. Let's go check it out. All right, so in this demo, I'm going to start off showing you my inventory. Uh, you can see those IP addresses are valid. The username and password you see there are not. They are just dummy credentials that I just need to have in existence for Ansible to instantiate the playbook. Um, what we are going to do here is I'm going to run this playbook. I'm going to call that inventory. I'm going to authenticate into HashiCorp Vault as part of my playbook. Um, and I'm going to use an app role, which an app role in, in Vault is designed to allow automated applications to authenticate without having to, to pass like human readable usernames and passwords. Instead, it uses a, a long string for both a role ID and a secret ID key. Um, so yeah, I'm going to authenticate into Vault. Um, I'm running this playbook in super slow motion so I can provide context and commentary over it. But uh, first, we're going to authenticate the Vault with this app role. That's going to pass back a token. It's kind of like Kerberos, where Vault has an initial authentication you do, and then it passes back a token, and then you use that token to re-authenticate to actually get passwords and credentials and other secrets out of the, uh, the Vault. So what I'm doing here is now that I've authenticated with the secret, I've been handed back a set of, um, of one-time passwords. I'm then instantiating a new dynamic inventory and in memory uh, with those two hosts, and then I'm using those credentials to authenticate into the host, and I'm running just a couple simple commands. Like I'm running host name here, so you can see that I've got an Ubuntu server, I've got a Fedora server. I'm then running who am I to validate that I am running as the Ansible user rather than those dummy users I had configured in the inventory. And then finally, I'm running an ID just to show again uh, what user accounts I'm authenticated with, what user, I, uh, user ID numbers they have. Um, so yeah, this is a, a and, and the nice thing is once I've authenticated, once I've, I've finished up that transaction, um, those passwords are no longer valid. Um, they are one-time use. Once you've authenticated it and, and uh, Vault has verified that they've been used, it ages them out. So again, I don't have to worry, even though I had the verbose logging and Ansible turned on, they're not exposed. Or if they are exposed, they can't be reused. All right, so to recap, here is what we went over today in this session. Uh, the first link is the Ansible Vault documentation available on ansible.com. This is a good guide for getting started, uh, how you can encrypt data with Vault and call it in the context of playbooks, use it in Tower and AWX. Uh, definitely a great place to get started if you want to learn about what Vault is in, in the context of Ansible and what it's capable of doing. Uh, the next link down there is the HashiCorp Vault project page. Now, uh, HashiCorp is an open source company. There is an open source uh, free as in beer uh, version of Vault. That is what I use today in the demo. Uh, and that's what this particular page will direct to. Now, they do have a enterprise paid version of Vault, which extends the, the functionality a bit, adds things like uh, namespacing. So you can have like a multi-tenant Vault implementation. Uh, def definitely recommend checking out the project page, and if, if you're interested, HashiCorp can definitely uh, help you uh, build an enterprise-ready ready, uh, security solution around Vault. And then the final link here is the, uh, the link to the, the resources I used today in my demo, my, uh, my Ansible playbook. Uh, actually, it is a role, and it's really kind of just a skeleton to show how you would use um, HashiCorp Vault to call a one-time SSH password and use that in the context of a playbook. Uh, it's definitely something you could build on and, and use in other, other use cases. But, uh, yeah, this will, this will at least get you started with using an, uh, OTPs from, from Vault. So, again, I thank you for checking out this session. Hope you enjoy the rest of Ansible Automates and have a great day.